This morning we are going to jump in and look at Jesus as the light of the world. And my hope and my, my expectation is that as we jump into this, into this series, the, the, the desire is that we are going to be able to get to know the Lord better. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and we are being transformed into his image with it ever increasing glory. So the more we behold him, the more we get to know him, the more we are changed, the more we look like him, the more we reflect him to the world. It doesn't happen overnight. It's an everyday journey until we finally get to the place, until we finally get to, to meet him. So Father, thank you again this morning. Speak to us. Your sons and your daughters are listening, God. Use me as your instrument, Lord. Speak through me. Give me clarity of thought and utterance, God. And let your word today, I'm a Fall on fertile ground and let it bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, there's a story that is told back home uh, about this city that had no light. It was a city of darkness. And it was like that for years and years. So the son decided that he was going to go visit that city. Like, how would there be a place without light? And so the son said, well, I'm going to go see the city that has no light. And the son goes to the city where there was no light. And the son was there for one month. And the son is not seeing darkness. The son stayed two months. The son is not seeing darkness. So the son decides, well, I'm going to find out. What is it? They told me that there was no light in the city. It's all darkness. And I came and I can't see darkness. And so the son went and asked one of the people who lived in the town. And like, before I came here, I heard that it was a city of darkness. And so I came to inquire of myself because I've never seen darkness and to see how darkness looks like. And one of the people who lived in the city told him, I'm so sorry, since you came, darkness left. Because wherever you are, darkness is surely going to disappear. And I think that's the same thing with Jesus. He is a light of the world. And when his light light comes, darkness automatically moves. Light is just so significant because like there is... There is no life without light. Just imagine, imagine a whole day where there is no sunshine, there is no moon, there are no stars in the sky, there is no electricity. Just one 24 hour day, just imagine how, that's, how chaotic that will look like. Darkness on the whole earth, the whole planet. And so it's, it's just impossible. There's actually no life without light. And that's why in the beginning when God started creation, God couldn't make anything else without first saying, let there be light. Those were the first three words he spoke. Let there be light. It was until light came that everything else could start taking form and take shape and, take and, and, and come into place because God is the one who speaks light in our darkness. And I'm going to just read the first verse that we read, that Beth read. Thank you, Beth. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but would have the light of life. When you look at this text, it is happening in the time when they are having the Jewish feast, the feast of the tabernacle. The Jewish people have several feasts, but they have three main feasts that are like big to them. And the feast of the tabernacle is one, because it's one of those feasts that reminds them of their journey through the wilderness. And this feast is filled with so much celebration. The women come out with dancing. The men have, because they can't make, they have like tents that they build on the house, that, like they set their tents on their houses. Now because it's contemporary world, some people will go to the park and set up tents all around the park and have it all lighted all around the place to just celebrate the feast. But that's, it was something special for them. So they had... All of this celebration happening, and it's a celebration that goes for seven days. And they have done all of first day, second day, and the the last day most often is the the Feast of the Torchlight, or the Feast of Light. And this Feast of of Light represents God going in front of the Israelites. You remember the Bible says in Exodus that God was before them like in a pillar of fire, lighting their way. So when the pillar of fire came, that was what showed them light and they were able to follow on light. When it, when it stopped, then they stopped. So that was what it represented to them. So it was, a, it was during the celebration of this torchlight ceremony, or of this lighting ceremony, that Jesus is coming and he's looking and everybody is sitting and all of that and he's like says, I am the light of the world. And when you, when you look be, below the next verses, you see how the, the Pharisees and the scribes are so upset with him like, 
What are you talking about? Like it is a fight. Just imagine I'm, I'm, I'm standing here, I'm preaching, I'm like, I say something and somebody from the crowd jump and like say, you are wrong. You can't say that. That was what was happening because Jesus was in the temple trying to just, and from the crowd, they were opposing him from the crowd. And Jesus is trying to explain why he says he's a light of the world uh, to those people. So these people understood exactly what Jesus meant when he says, I'm the light of the world. They understood that Jesus was trying to claim that he was God. And that's why they were opposing because like, Jesus, we know you. We know your mom. We know your dad. We saw you play and was soccer around this place or football. And we saw you dirty. We, I used to send you to go carry, help me carry wood. Were well, you not know, the one playing with my children all around like, Come on, Jesus, how dare you say you were God? Because somehow in their own human senses, they couldn't believe that this little boy or this, he had grown to become a young man that they knew was God. And so there's argument and there is fighting and there is, they're trying to discredit Jesus' testimony. And isn't it amazing that even in our days, we still try to discredit that Jesus is not God. The world has not stopped fighting. The fact that Jesus is God. The world has not stopped to argue. The fact that Jesus is God. The Bible says it is like, it is, it is foolishness to those who do not believe. Like, how dare you? And that's one of the things that distincts us Christians from other, because there are several religions that believe in one God, like, uh, like um, Islam, like Judaism and all of that. One of the things that distinct us from other religions is we are Trinitarian. We believe in God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus is God. But all the other religions were like, no, no. If you say Jesus is God, it's, then you're saying it's three gods. No, that's not what we are saying. We believe that Jesus was there from the beginning, like John says in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. That Jesus is God. He's not a second God. He's not God's younger brother. He is God. And it's so fundamental because if we miss that, then we miss the core of Christianity. Then all this thing we are saying, Lent and Easter, doesn't have essence. Because the only reason why it matters it was because, is because Jesus himself was God. So when Jesus died on the cross, it was God dying on the cross. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was God having victory over dead. It wasn't God's younger brother, it was God himself. When he was born in a manger, it was God that came and took that, took into the, in the form of a baby. It, Jesus is God. It's fundamental for us as believers to understand and to, and to believe that. So this morning, we are going to just look at a few things. What does it mean when Jesus says, I am the light of of the world. I am the light of the world. What does that mean? The first thing, as I said, is that it means he is God. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm having a mix up in my notes. Okay, as I said, the first thing is that Jesus, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it means he is God. He is a God who was, he is a God who is, he is a God who is to come. He was a, he's a light that God spoke, let there be, but then also he was the one who spoke, let there be, he was the one who spoke, let there be light. He was the one who was present in Jesus when he came, but then he's the one who is also going to shine. The Bible talks about in Revelations, in Isaiah, talking about when we finally go to heaven, there will be no need for a sun or the moon because he will be the light. We will not need sun in heaven, we will not need moon in heaven because God himself will be the light. I can't imagine like how beautiful that would be. <laughs> like God himself is light. And that's what the Bible says. We can't fully even look at his face because of the light that comes out of it. It can blind us. That's beautiful and incredible. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we are saying that he is God. But when we also say Jesus is Lord, we are saying that he's able to bring order into our chaos. We see in Genesis when he said, let there be light. Order started coming into the world, the earth that was without any form and void. When Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, he was indirectly telling those people, I know your world looks chaotic, I know the things you are going through seems like 
There's no, there's no way out, but I am able to bring order in the midst of that chaos. And at times when our lives get so chaotic, the tendency is to want to try to fix it. The tendency is to want to try to, to look for order in our own ability, but we don't have what it takes to bring order. All God is like saying, if you would come, I'm going to bring order in the midst of that chaos. Jesus specializes in bringing order in chaos. It doesn't matter how messed up it is. He knows how to bring order in chaos. In the life that is torn and rejected, in the circumstance that, that feels hopeless, he specializes in bringing order in chaos. If you look at the woman in the, in the, the few verses before um, verse 12, we had this woman who had been accused of adultery, and she's brought there, and they're like, Stone her, Jesus, what do you say? Because she's been caught in adultery. And her life is chaotic. She's feeling like I'm at the end of my life. So what happens to me? And Jesus, instead of stoning, Jesus starts writing. And he asks just one simple question that brings order in the life of that woman. He says, if none of you has ever seen, then pick the first stone and shoot her. And everybody starts disappearing. And Jesus says one line to the woman, go and sin no more. And her life that was messed up and chaotic was brought back to order. Dignity was restored. Hope was restored. True meaning was restored. I can't imagine how she left that place with Jesus and how she started living her life every day. We see the Samaritan woman when Jesus meets her and Jesus is like, and she's trying to argue with Jesus, who is the real God and all of that. And Jesus is like, well, you don't even understand. And Jesus says, you have You've had six husbands, and this is number seven. And Jesus was, and the woman was like, okay, you found, you, you discovered who I am. And immediately her life was changed and turned around. And that woman who would not even go out to fetch water when everybody was out, now can finally boldly walk and tell others about this Jesus that she has experienced. Because when Jesus steps into a life, he brings order in the middle of our chaos. It's not even only in the lives of sinners. It's when there is brokenness, when there is love. Whatever it is, Jesus knows how to bring light in the middle of our chaos. So when, God, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, I can bring order in your chaos. And the, only, the first way he does is by a rela- when we come into a relationship with him. And the second way that happens, in Colossians it says, he who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the the kingdom of his dear son. And the second way is when we invite him in the dark areas of our lives and of our families. One of the things about hiding is that when we hide, we have to constantly hide. Have you ever told a lie that you shouldn't have told? And you found yourself you had to tell the second one to protect the first one? And then the third one to protect the second and you just find yourself in this circle of bondage and enslavement, and now you are careful what to say because you don't know if what you are going to say now is going to match up what you first said because of what you first said was a lie. And there is this enslavement and this bondage, and the only reason that happened was because a human was trying to cover up and preserve a false self that was not real. And how many times do we present this false self to the world that is not a real us? Because we are so afraid, what if I really present the real me? Will people really like the real me? Will people even talk to the real me? And something came to mind when I was thinking of this sermon and I was imagining, what if on a Sunday morning like this, a video of my thoughts, my actions, my imaginations was played on TV for the last 24 hours? For people to watch. Would they like me after they watch the video? And it was a good test for me. And I was like, Verma, are you, are you being true to who God has called you to be? Are you living authentic? Or are you living false? And it's the same thing. Anytime we live covered, we are, living, we, we are living in darkness and we are covering that light and we're not letting that light shine. But God calls us to let the light shine. He wants to shine in every area of our lives. No area 
has to be left out. He wants to shine in every area. The third thing, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying he was the one who led Israel in the wilderness. The same way he was in, in, in the wilderness, he will go a certain, the light will go and then stop at a certain point and Israel will stop and then he will turn direction and Israel will turn. Most often in this life, we don't know which path to follow. Our human mind wants to make the decision based on what we can humanly imagine. But there is a God who wants to lead us. Jesus is saying, I want to lead you. Do you have a tough decision you make and don't know what to do? Ask me. I want to be the light. I want to give you clarity. I want to show you how. I want to help you what is right and what is not right. He wants to lead us in the decisions we make. In Psalms 119, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will counsel you with my eye upon you. God wants to lead us. And when Jesus says he's the light of the world, he's also saying, I want to make you the light of the world. Isn't that incredible? So if I am the light, because I am the light of the world, you can become the light of the world. That's amazing. It's almost like Jesus is saying, don't worry, guys. I'm going to step out of the scene and I'm going to make you are going to be the star. And if the world is looking for direction, I'm going to just point them towards you because you will be the one showing them the light. He says, we are the light of the world. We are called to shine for the world to see. It is amazing. It is beautiful. But what is funny is like I brought my, my torch. Like, can somebody help me dim a little? Thank you, Marcy. Yeah, it might not be yes, but just imagine like this light, this light represents Jesus, and this is us. We have three different people, Christians here. And this one is like, I just love Jesus. I want to just shine. I know I'm not perfect, but God, I'm just going to let your light shine through me. Can you see the light like almost as clearly as it was? Bright and clear because the person is like, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to let Jesus shine through me. But then guess what? There is another. Another Christian. You can barely see. You see how the Christian is? There's so much stains all around. So tinted and different things. Maybe it's fear, insecurity. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. So you have all the different parts. Fear, insecurity, sin, self, selfishness, and self-centeredness. So many things are just... The light is the same. That's what I want us to know. The light is the same. The light has not changed. But the container is different. The person who reflects the light determines how bright the light is going to shine. The light is the same because it is God's light, Jesus' light in the inside of us. But we can choose to let it shine brightly or we can choose to not let it shine. But then we have this other believer who says, Jesus, I know you died. I know you were really good. Come on, that's my thing. Are you not walking? I know you are really good, Jesus, but this light is for me alone. I can't let people see it. Because what if they see it, then they might ask me a question I don't know how to answer. What if I shine the light, Jesus? The light is in there. It's not that the light is not there. It's still there, but somebody else decides to hide it. And that's what the Bible says. Who lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel? It's supposed to be up. This light makes no difference. Thank you, Masi. It makes no difference when it's not reflecting. It's not shining out to the world. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying that you are the light of the world. But as I said, every believer has the same light, but we determine the brightness of that light. How bright would you let your light shine? 
We determine the brightness. Jesus doesn't determine it. We determine how bright the light will shine. We can let it shine in such a way that lacing is so impacted by just one life. Or we can let it shine just a little bit. We determine the brightness of that light. Wolford Lee says something. Some paths lead us into light, but others take down the take us down an ever dimming path into darkness. There are some paths we take, some decisions that we take that can lead us to keep shining that light. But then there are some decisions that we take that can keep taking us down and taking us down and steal the light from the inside of us. And we find ourselves being dimmed and our light not as bright as, should, as it should be because we've allowed other things to cloud the light. The cares of this world, the circumstances, those who shine don't shine because they don't go through trouble. They just choose to shine. <laughs> because what is amazing is that having Jesus actually, when you are the light, it means you are on the side. You are like on the front and everything else that is not light sees the light. And most often you can become a target when your light starts to really shine. The difference is, would you cover your light when the attacks come or would you let it just keep shining? Because the more it shines, the more other people are drawn to the light and they are transformed by their light. The next thing is, when we cover our light like in Matthew says and we hide it, the world will not see it. And the world cannot come to the light that it doesn't see. There are many people around us, fathers, brothers, sisters, who need to come to the light. But the only way they would come is if they see the light. Jesus is not here anymore. You are here. I am here. Now you are the light of the world. It's amazing, but then also it's a big responsibility. It's frightening that Jesus would entrust me and entrust you and say, you are the light of the world. When, when Jesus says we are the light of the world, it means he has released us to be able to bring others from darkness into light. And he says this to Apostle Paul, was saying this about his testimony. He says, um, when God has sent, he says, I'm sending you to open the eyes and turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified in faith. This verse really got my attention. It's actually saying when somebody is not in the light and does not have a relationship with God, they are under the power of Satan. They might be nice and good, but they are still under the power of Satan. They might be kind-hearted, but when they don't have a relationship with Jesus, they are still under the power of Satan. So what do I do about that? What do I do about the people I love so much who are still bound by the enemy and I know they are in darkness? They might act well and talk well. I know they are still in darkness. What do I do about them? When God has sent me to be the one to free them from that bondage, am I going to let them in bondage of the enemy? Am I going to say, oh, they are just nice, they are really nice people, they are good. Or am I going to let them know that Jesus is the light. And it's until they come to that light that they experience light. It's only when we tell the light, come in and light my heart, that we can experience that light. And are we going to let those that we know, that we love, that we, who are precious to us, come to that light. This calls me to intercession for the people that I love, for family members that I'm still trusting God, for them to be saved because I'm like, devil, you can't have any of my family members. No, no way, no way. They are nice, they are good, but I know they don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, so I can't take it for granted because somehow I don't want them to be ensnared in the darkness. I know they have the nice moral morals, but without a relationship with Jesus, they are still in darkness. So what do I do about that? There's a quote that says, you cannot defeat darkness by running from it. 
You can only conquer your inner demons by hiding them. Nor can you conquer your inner demons by hiding them from the world. In order to defeat darkness, you must bring light into it. That's by Seth Adam. So this morning as we step out from this place, I want to leave us with a question. This morning we've heard Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And he says, because he is the light of the world, he says, you are the light of the world. What would you do about Jesus as the light of the world? And what are you going to do about your own light? Let us pray. This morning, maybe there's someone who's watching online and you're saying, yeah, I feel like my life has been in darkness. And I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I need his light in my life. I want to pray with you. Or you might even be here and you have God's light in you, but so many things have choked the light and hindered it from shining well. And this morning we are one to say, God, I want to take off the things that hinder my light from shining so it can shine brightly. Father, I pray for my brother, for my sister.